Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a very, very special guest with me today, Stefan Thomas, who's the founder and CEO of Coil, as well as the co-creator of the Interledger Protocol. Stefan, it's an honor to be speaking with you today. Oh, thank you so much. You're too kind. <laughs> it's great speaking with you. Well, Stefan, there's so many things I want to ask you because you've been in the crypto market for a very long time. Lots of stories, lots of different companies you've worked for. Um, tell us about your background. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Germany. Um, I started playing around with computers at a very early age, um, kind of got addicted to it, um, became a web developer. So for a while, I was just freelancing, um, making websites for people, 50 bucks an hour. Can hire me, um, and uh, yeah. Over time, I I started noticing that there was a lot of friction in payments. Like when you're a freelancer, you kind of um, your your income's very variable. So I overdrafted my account a couple of times while I was living in the UK, um, and so they eventually just closed it, which I didn't know that you can get your account closed just by overdrafting it a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just noticed when I when I was paying other freelancers, uh, so I was working with sometimes you subcontract like a designer or something like that. Um, I noticed that there was just huge fees, huge delays, and so on in payments. So that sort of started to to become a theme that I was interested in. But I also didn't feel like, as a developer, I really had any way to influence that. It seemed like the domain of governments and banks. So that's kind of uh, my background. Got it. And you, well, I should ask. Let, let me let me back up a bit. What was your first encounter with Bitcoin and the crypto market? And what was your aha moment? Like, wow, this is interesting. I want to get into this. Yeah, so um, I was living in Switzerland at the time. This is 2010. And I um, I was sort of, we, we had done a company around actually content monetization. So not, not uh, totally unrelated to what I'm doing now, but um, we had sort of wound it down. Uh, we sold off the assets to to one of our customers, which was a large publisher in Switzerland. And um, you know, I was not not ready to get into anything super serious at the time. And so I spent a lot of time just kind of like browsing the web for interesting stuff. And I used a service called Stumble Upon, which was literally like a button you would click and it would take you to a random website. And the random website it took me to was Bitcoin.org. Um, and I should I should preface this with like I was using it a lot. Like I was literally going through tens of thousands of websites, just click, 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 <laughs> click. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, one, one of them was Bitcoin.org and I was sort of reading through it and I'm like, that's really interesting. And as I mentioned before, I had sort of a, you know, in the back of my mind was sort of thinking about payments already. And so I was like, hmm, I wonder if this kind of thing could help. And it especially seemed like the first time that an individual like open source developer could sort of get involved and have some kind of impact. Right. And so that's how, um, that's how I found out about it. And that, that's why I got interested. Wow. Uh, just so amazing. Cause I remember using stubble, stubble upon too a lot. And even as an affiliate marketer back then, I was using it as a link distribution, <laughs> a tactic, so to speak, but that's yeah, the, so kid, the kids don't know, but stumble upon was a big deal <laughs> for sure. So when you found out about it, did you start mining Bitcoin or did you buy some Bitcoin? What was your next step? Yeah. So, um, so I found out about it in the summer of, of 2010. And so, um, you know, the summers in Switzerland are quite warm, um, at least where I was near Zurich. Um, and I had a pretty tiny apartment um, because rents are pretty high in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to do was have a hot running computer mining Bitcoins. And so I actually, um, instead of doing that, um, I started talking to people on IRC, the, the chat, uh, Bitcoin chat uh, at the time. And um, I started asking if anyone wanted to like sell some Bitcoins. And I found like a couple of people that wanted to to you know sell mostly just for fun because they thought it was funny that you could run your computer for a while, generate this digital money, and then get real money for it. And so I, I remember I had a deal with someone. Um, I think they were a student at Berkeley and said so free electricity from their dorm room, and so they just ran like a CPU miner. And so every time they they found a block, they would get fifty bitcoins, and I would pay them fifty bucks for it. And that was sort of we we did that for a couple of months. Got it. And uh, obviously, I know your your story has been well uh, mentioned in the media and press and so forth about your the Bitcoin that you don't have or, or that you're mm -hmm. unable to access. So how many Bitcoin did you end up owning, if you can share that, and, and mm -hmm. how many are inaccessible at this point? Yeah. So aside from the coins that I bought, uh, which I thankfully didn't lose, 
Um, I also did, the, you know, there was this bounty for making an animated video about Bitcoin. Um, I had a friend who was finishing his degree in motion graphics, and so we teamed up to make that video. Um, and so we won a bounty of 9,052 9, Bitcoin. Wow. Um, and I took 2000 um, for like the expenses and kind of turned it into, into cash and kind of you know, gave it away and, and, and paid everyone off who helped with the video. Um, and then I had like 7,052 left and I was like, what do I do with that? And so the idea was to have sort of a Bitcoin marketing fund, like a spread the word for better payments kind of fund. Um, and I ended up giving 50 Bitcoins to the, uh, to the real Plato, who was a Bitcoin user at the time, who was doing like a coast to coast Bitcoin road trip. Um, and so it was like to, to help with the road trip. And then the next time I wanted to access it was to refill the Bitcoin faucet, which was like the service where you could go and, and um, get some free Bitcoin just to test it out. Um, and so one day, like Gavin, um, Gavin Andreessen, who was the lead developer, um, he messaged me, said like, hey, would you mind taking some of the, the money from the you know marketing fund to, to put into this faucet? And I was like, yeah, sure, totally. And so I like tried to log in, didn't work. I had two backups. I tried to log into the backups, didn't work either. Um, and so then it sort of sunk in that like I might have lost access to those to those bitcoins. So that was probably worst day of my life. <laughs> so, but it's ten years ago now, so like I can laugh about it now. But yeah, it was it was not great. Got it. But uh, but it sounds like you still have some bitcoin. You may have some other cryptos. Uh, I'm assuming XRP. Can you tell us about your portfolio and what you have in there? Sure. Um, so basically, you know, if you're an early bitcoiner. Um, you know, I was, I had a decent stash of Bitcoins when I first got into it because it was very cheap to buy them. Um, so even though I didn't have a ton of money to invest, like I, I managed to, to, you know, scrape together a decent stash, but the problem was I was also working full time on Bitcoin and, you know, back then there were no Bitcoin companies that could give you a salary. Um, and so I think I was actually one of the first people who would like quit their jobs or didn't have a job and full time worked on Bitcoin. Um, but what that meant was I ended up selling a lot at very low prices as well, just to pay rent, to pay for groceries, like that sort of thing. Um, so I pay, pay, uh, sold quite a lot in like 2011 and then 2012. Um, and then finally in 2012, I got a job at, at Ripple and so finally had a salary again. Um, in terms of portfolio, like I'm probably the, the most boring crypto trader ever. Um, because in terms of investment, I bought Bitcoin in 2010 and some in 2011. Um, I sold off a bunch in 2011, 2012 of Bitcoin. I bought some XRP with some of my Bitcoin in 2013. Um, and then I sold some XRP in 2017. And that's pretty much all the crypto trades I've done. Like I've bought some, you know, crypto just for testing. Like I might've bought some like IOTA, like 50 bucks worth of IOTA to test it out or something like that. But um, as an investment, the only cryptos I ever invested in were Bitcoin and XRP. Got it. Um, with the inaccessible Bitcoin, I know you have about two two more tries as far as the code. Um, do, you, do you think it's kind of a moot point at, at right now? Or do you think we're waiting for a more advanced technology that may be able to crack it? Yeah, so I mean, I got incredibly lucky because of all the media attention. And so a lot of people reached out saying like they can help. And so... You know, at first it was a little bit overwhelming to be to be frank, because like a lot of people were like, "Hey, you know, try this, try this, try this," and I was like, just trying to keep up with all the emails was difficult. Um, but among all the inquiries, there were a couple of ones um, which were some very serious, um, very experienced data recovery people, um, and so we got to talking, and and I now think there is a chance um, that it might be recoverable. Um, it will be a pretty big project, and I'm also pretty tied up with, you know, being CEO of Coil. I don't want to like just shut down the company while I go work on this. So um, I'll take it slow. I'll, I'll probably do it over the summer. Maybe we'll see. Um, but yeah, there is a chance I might be able to recover it, which would always be super nice. But then, of course, I have the bigger problem of what the hell to do with the money. So we'll see. <laughs> well, I hope you're able to get it and uh, you know crack it open there. Uh, so wish you best of luck on that front. Um, let's talk about Ripple and your time there as CTO and what was the work and what was your accomplishments before you, you know, move on to Coil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I joined Ripple and one of the funny stories about that is when I first got hired, I actually asked to have in writing in my contract that I wouldn't have to manage anyone <laughs> and I would be able to stay in Switzerland and not have to move to the US. Wow. Um, 
And, you know, for a few months, that was great. And then um, the two, two main founders, Chris and Jed, they started to get into a dispute with each other. And so Jed ended up leaving, which left the CTO seat open. And so now I was the most senior developer there, or like the most experienced developer. I'd been CTO at, at several of my previous jobs. And so eventually I was asked like, well, do you want to be CTO, you know? And so, which wasn't great because that meant moving to the US and I would have to manage people. Um, but it ended up being the sort of thing where I'm like, okay, well, who else is going to do it, right? Like there aren't that, there weren't that many people with a lot of experience back then because everything was so new. Um, and so I ended up taking on the role um, and uh, yeah, really enjoyed working with that group of people because, um, you know, one thing that I started to dislike about the Bitcoin community around that time was people had started to get rich off of Bitcoin. Um, and so it started to attract people that were just purely there to get, get rich, get money, whatever. And as I mentioned, like I was in it because I wanted to make payments better. That was the thing that I cared about. Um, and so I, joining Ripple was nice because everyone there seemed to also care about making payments better, not about getting rich. And so um, I felt like I found the right, you know, peers there. Yeah, absolutely. The, the vision of the company is to uh, move money the same way a data is moved. And uh, tell me about the development of the Interledger protocol. That Was that done at, the, at your time at Ripple? Yeah. Um, so... I kind of have to go back a little bit because Interledger is really based about, well, it started with lessons that I learned while I was working on Bitcoin. Um, so back in 2011, um, I was maintaining a, a re-implementation of Bitcoin in JavaScript called Bitcoin JS. Mm -hmm. um, there's part of it that's still actively being used um, and actively being maintained by other developers, uh, which is the sort of client side portion. So like that can run in your browser, it can sign transactions, so you can do uh, Bitcoin transactions generated in the browser um, without having to download a scary exe file, you know, run it on your computer. Right. Um, but I also, back then, I, I also re-implemented all the other parts of Bitcoin, the server-side parts, the, um, the, the node, the script interpreter, the mining algorithm, like basically the whole thing. And so as a result, I, you know, learned a lot about how Bitcoin works. And so I was um, spending a lot of time talking to um, Russell, who who was maintaining a, um, a Bitcoin implementation, Mike Hearn, who did Bitcoin J. Um, and there was sort of this kind of group of people, which were all the people that were maintaining um, implementations. Um, and that's that group turned into the group that sort of, at that time, was talking about a lot of the protocol changes or improvements that could be made to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, there were some things that actually started in Bitcoin JS, which I'm pretty proud of. Like, for example, I found a much faster way to do blockchain downloads. Um, and when Peter Wolle came over to Switzerland to interview at Google, he was staying at my place um, to, you know, because Bitcoiners would just stay over at each other's places at the time. You know, it's just yeah. like a pretty tight knit community at that time. And so, um, you know, I talked to him, showed him like what I had done. And so that later became known as Ultra Prune and made it into Bitcoin Core. And I think it still uh, informs like how blockchain downloads are, are done today. And so um, anyway, so through that period, I started to learn a lot about how protocol governance works for something like Bitcoin. I think that um, when you read the sort of the PR speak, um, people will tell you Bitcoin is like pure math and the algorithm is eternal and, you know, it's not run by humans and that's just not true at all. Um, it was very much run by humans and I was one of those humans. And so um, there were a couple of experiences where, you know, for example, um, you know, we were trying to make this change to the address format um, is the change called page to script hash. So even today, if you see Bitcoin addresses that start with a three, that was a change that, that I helped work on. Oh, wow. um, and the, the change took a very long time to get from, you know, proposal to actually deployed on, on, on the chain. Um, and that was back in 2011, 2012, I don't remember exactly, but, um, I just remember thinking like, wow, if that took that long, how long is it going to take to do all the other things that I think need to happen for Bitcoin to actually go mainstream and like be used in payments? Because again, I wasn't just interested in it as a store of value. I was interested in it as a payment method. Right. Um, and so, you know, I was 
I got pretty depressed by that calculation because I came up with like, well, it's going to take like 50 years. And that was without really assuming that Bitcoin was going to grow, get bigger, bigger market cap and things slow down further because the more stakeholders you have, the more people you have to kind of get to agree to any change. And so it was that sort of thought about governance. And, you know, when I joined Ripple, um, the XRP ledger had a lot of features that were on my list of things that I thought Bitcoin would need, um, like a move away from proof of work, um, the ability to send different kinds of currencies, a decentralized exchange. So it had a lot of stuff that I thought would be really useful. Um, but at the same time, I um, still felt that the fundamental governance issue wasn't addressed because a blockchain, it's a system of shared states. So you all have the same knowledge about the state of the world, basically, right? Every node in the blockchain system has the same knowledge about the state of the world. And so as a result, not a lot of um, decisions are private. So, you know, uh, you know, the way everything works is kind of agreed upon by everyone, how transactions are signed, how authentication works and so on. And that's what makes it so difficult to, to maintain and scale and keep up to date because every change sort of needs this global agreement. And when you have a big global network, and it was even like Bitcoin 2012, you could see that happening, of course, even more so now, it just makes everything very, very slow to evolve. Um, you can compare it maybe to the internet where the switch from IPv4 to IPv6 has been going on as long as I can remember, right? Um, and it's still going on, right? And so whenever you have a global system with a lot of participants and you're trying to make a fundamental change that affects everyone, it takes a long time. Right. And so I started thinking of, uh, while I was at Ripple, like how do you solve this fundamental problem? And it, I realized that like you had to make it so that fewer changes require global agreements. So you can do more changes privately, but you can still have some kind of global interoperability. Hmm. Um, that's really a lesson that I took away from studying how the internet works because, you know, I mentioned the IPv4 to IPv6 transition. Well, that's really just to, to fix like one very specific thing, or at least that's the main motivating reason they're switching, which is the address space. Like IPv4 address space was pretty limited. IPv6 address space is a lot larger. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's happened this whole time where the internet has gotten better without the internet protocol itself changing, like Wi-Fi 6 came out, so people start deploying Wi-Fi 6 locally. And so IntelliJ is essentially, it's a very long-winded way of explaining it, but IntelliJ is essentially a way to uh, get that same sort of agility for payments. So you can have different ledgers, they evolve, new ones come out, old ones go away, but what people actually integrate with and adopt is Interledger. And so all of those changes can happen in the background without everyone having to upgrade. Um, and it also takes a lot of very contentious things out of the equation. Like for example, with a blockchain, if I wanna standardize on Bitcoin, for example, well, I have to agree with how the Bitcoins were distributed, right? right? Um, and if I wasn't back there back then, if I, you know, I was there back then, so I'm happy, right? But as someone who wasn't, didn't have the chance to buy Bitcoins for a dollar each, like might feel that's a little unfair, you know? And so um, I, I really think that payment standards shouldn't advantage like one token or one coin over another. It should be just an abstraction layer. That's what people integrate with. And then the tokens should compete on their properties. Like who is the fastest, who's the cheapest, who's the safest, most secure, et cetera. Got it. I appreciate that background because it really lays the groundwork here on the, the genesis of the idea and, and, and the, the, the solution you're bringing to the table. So for those who are listening who may not um, be fully up to speed on the interledger protocol, is it essentially a way to bridge all multiple blockchains to have more interoperability? So the XRP ledger, maybe Ethereum blockchain, would that be fair to say to enable payments between each of them? So there's something you just said, which is so funny to me because for some reason, the blockchain space has evolved to be this thing that's like completely almost hermetically sealed from the rest of the world. You asked, does it connect different blockchains together? And the answer is yes, it does. But it also, and I think that's more important, connects blockchains to like non-blockchain ledgers, right? Because the way Interledger works, it's it's essentially just a protocol for um, sending each other little packets of money. Mm. Um, what's really, really important to understand is unlike a blockchain, Interledger doesn't keep any state. It doesn't write down what anyone's balance is. It doesn't have any 
signatures to, to authorize transactions or anything like that. That's all handled by underlying, you know, ledger systems, right? So if I log into my bank and I say, you know, here's my, you know, password, um, that's up to that bank to decide what that protocol is. Interledger doesn't tell you. Um, and similarly, like it doesn't tell you that you have to settle on a blockchain or not a blockchain or something else that hasn't been invented yet. Um, right. It's really just completely neutral. Again, kind of inspired by the internet, which doesn't care if you use Wi-Fi or satellite connection or whatever. As long as you can send a packet of, of data, you can you can be on the internet. Um, and so Interledger is basically the same thing, but you're sending packets of money. Got it. Um, that, that totally makes sense. So connect bridging kind of the new crypto world, even with the traditional financial world and, and, and with the ability to send payments, regardless of what platform or whatever it may be. Yeah, because no matter what we tell ourselves, like, you know, if you look at the history of technology, it's always about the technologies that went out are always the ones that work well with what's already there. Because, you know, well, there's already a lot of investment in, into existing infrastructure and you have to somehow meet people where they are. Like you have to, in this case, meet people where their money is, which is in banks and mobile money providers and so on. Um, and so just by saying like, oh, everyone has to switch to this new infrastructure, you're not gonna get very far. Sure. Um, so are you still involved with the Interledger protocol since you know helping create it? And if you are, what are some of the new initiatives that you're working on and, and uh, what's maybe in the works for this year? Yeah, so very recently we announced the launch of the Interledger Foundation. Um, so that's like the first time there's actually like a legal entity and it, it does a couple of things. It holds the intellectual property associated with Interledger. So there's some patents, um, there's obviously a logo, there's the name Interledger. So the foundation owns all of that. Um, but it may also have some, some role to play within the network. So for example, um, we are thinking about like maybe it could act as a um, as a as a an entity where you can sort of report what your policies are. So, for example, if you're on Interledger and let's say you do OFAC screening, you could tell the Interledger Foundation, "Hey, we do OFAC screening," and so then everyone in the network can see, "Okay, Stefan's company does OFAC screening," and so companies that are that require that because they're U.S. companies, for example, they can see that and then decide to transact with you. Um, so that's you know kind of a, uh, something that happened recently since Ledger Foundation. In terms of the protocol itself, um, you know, the, you know, the Interledger protocol itself has been stable for quite a few years now, right? Like we haven't actually changed it in a while. Um, and the um, more recent work has been mostly around uh, higher level protocols that build on top of Interledger that enable more complex payments use cases, things like um, subscriptions, you know, updating subscriptions where you have like amounts changing from month to month, um, th those sorts of things. And uh, third-party app access, so like you have a wallet and then you're giving an app access to that wallet, those kinds of things have been the recent focus. Got it. Um, and the Interledger protocol obviously created by you and, and, and another person at Ripple. So does Evan Ripple- uh, Yeah, uh, I keep forgetting his name, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do, does Ripple own the rights to Interledger Protocol? Uh, how, how is that going to be? Are you going to, are you going to license it out or is it just open to the web? Um, uh, can you tell us a bit about that dynamic? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I, it was invented while uh, we were at Ripple. And so Ripple owned the intellectual property for Interledger. And that's all been transferred to the Interledger Foundation now. And so the purpose of the foundation is basically to say like all of this is completely open, completely free for the world and no one company controls it. Got it, got it. Um, so what led to you leaving Ripple and deciding to start Coil and which obviously is looking to solve the web monetization problem that we currently have? Can you tell us about that journey? Totally, yeah. So around 2018 was when um, we realized like there was only so much you could do to to promote Interledger in from, from the vantage point that we were at, like from, from the lab, basically. Um, the protocols set, were settling down. Um, we really needed like practical implementation experience. We really needed like actual adoption of the protocol. Um, and so, you know, for a while I tried to find like a way to productize it from within Ripple to say like, hey, we have some intelligent products. You should go use this protocol, something like that. But I remember like I one particular conversation, uh, I like thinking uh, thinking back to that sort of illustrates my point is, 
you know, I was talking to this uh, banker. Um, he's like, a, uh, I think he was in commercial payments. So like, you know, company to company payments. And we were talking about Interledger and I was like, oh, it could be used for micropayments. And he was like, yeah, you know, micropayments are not that common kind of thing. And so I eventually asked him like what he actually understood under the term micropayment. And he said, any payment under $10,000, what, what we call a <laughs> micropayment. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, these guys are not necessarily the early adopters for a network that can switch like tiny packets of money, right? Um, and I, I started thinking about like, well, what, who would be early adopters? And if you look at the history of the internet, it was sort of academic institutions, like, um, you know, hobbyists, um, you know, just people who were interested in technology, fascinated by technology and so on. And so we decided that this would be better as a consumer focused uh, approach. Um, and Ripple is really very, very enterprise focused, right? And so it didn't really fit in there. So I, I decided to start a new company that was just completely focused on, um, you know, kind of getting Interledger off the ground. Um, and the use case that we picked was basically how do you compensate because the web really doesn't have a built-in payment mechanism today. Um, and so people have found these awkward workarounds where you just aggregate a lot of content together onto one huge platform. And then that platform charges a su subscription or you know, another model is you aggregate a bunch of people's data together and then you show them ads. And yeah. then you know, those ad networks uh, make money. Uh, but both of those, as you, as you notice, like both of those are very heavily scale dependent. So like you, they tend to favor larger companies. And so that's what we've seen. It's like we've seen huge aggregation of, of these companies into you know, just a few big tech companies now. And so um, I don't feel like that's a great match for the web, which is by nature like pretty decentralized. Anyone can run their own web server and so on. Um, and so by fixing that business model, we feel like we're solving a real problem and it's a great first use case for Interledger. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I don't know if I'm you know, correct in, in positioning this well in what you're doing, but we see a move towards privacy GDPR. Um, obviously you got the Brave browser, DuckDuckGo, and uh, it, it seems that things are trending towards what you're trying to build here. I mean, less ads, um, web monetization and maybe more privacy and less cookie tracking and all that. Is, is that correct? Yeah. And I think that the main thing that we're bringing to the table is Interledger, right? I think that um, when you sort of really look at the problem, you know, there've been a lot of approaches to try to do uh, micropayments on the web before, but they always involve some kind of single entity, right? Like somebody collects all the money and then they distribute it out. Um, and so, by building on Interledger, what it allows you to do is it allows you to have any uh, number of providers that can um, pay out um, and you have any number of wallets that can receive the money um, and they can all be connected to each other with Interledger. So that doesn't have to be somebody who operates the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the most, um, the most exciting thing about what we're doing within web monetization is that, you know, Right now, Coil is the only provider, but anyone could literally start their own provider, start providing the same service that we're providing, and you could make web monetization without any connection to Coil whatsoever, right? Like completely unrelated to us. And so um, that's what makes it truly open. And that's why I think it can actually be a web standard. I think even something that's built on a given blockchain or, or one specific crypto isn't neutral enough to be a web standard, right? Because then you're sort of benefiting the holders of that particular token, whatever the case may be, right? And so it really takes something that's token neutral and uh, something that can evolve faster. And we were talking about that earlier with like Interledger really specifies only the absolute minimum globally and it leaves everything else up to individual network participants. And so I think that's the nature, that's the type of system you need for this kind of use case. Got it. And speaking of token, obviously the coil leverages XRP for the micropayments and it, it, you mentioned other possible tokens could be used as well within the Quill ecosystem, given that you're using the larger protocol? Yeah, so um, yeah, a couple of things there. So number one, the way Intelligent works is it's essentially this sort of network where, you know, let's say you and I could be peered and then, you know, there's someone else over there, Bob, he, he could be peered with you. And so I could send you a packet uh, and then you would forward that packet to Bob if that's who it's addressed to, right? And so the actual settlement or like the integration with ledgers, the way it works is that you and I have some kind of arrangement for how I'm going to actually give you real money, 
right? At some point, I got to give you some kind of money because if I keep sending you packets, like at some point, I got to settle this up and, and, and give you actual value. Um, how I do that is completely between you and me, hmm. right? So if, if we said like, okay, um, every 60 days, uh, we're going to meet up in this meadow and you're going to hand me a bag full of marshmallows, um, that, that we could settle that way, you know, or we could settle with, you know, um, with gold bars, or we could settle, you know, by me sending you a bundle of cash in the mail. Like, it really doesn't matter how we settle. Um, and so as a result, like one of the ways you could settle is I could send you some crypto and I can send you any crypto I want. And it doesn't have to have any special features. It doesn't have to have any special, you know, capabilities. As long as you can transfer a value, you can use it as a settlement method for Interledger. Um, there is some benefits to what some settlement methods over others. So for example, if a ledger allows you to settle very cheaply, like the transaction fees are low, that's probably better than a ledger where every single settlement costs you a lot of money. Um, and not just because the fees are lower, but when the fees are lower, you may choose to settle more often. And so your risk actually goes down as well, because if I settle with you every 60 days, I got to trust you for that amount, right? Or you got to trust me for that amount rather. Um, but if I settle with you every five minutes, there's, there's a lot less trust required, right? Um, you can also, there's certain uh, capabilities in the ledger that might be useful in the future um, to settle even more often, things like payment channels, basically. So if I wanted to settle with you like a couple times per second, I could do that with payment channels potentially. Um, and so the reason we use XRP is because like right now it's just a really uh, cheap, efficient, very liquid way to settle um, our Interledger transactions. That's why we're using it. Also, we're funded by Ripple. So of course they're happy that we're using it. Sure. Um, and, but in principle, you can use whatever you want. Um, and it's sort of up to the network participants on a bilateral basis. So like between two peers to decide what that group wants to settle in. Got it. Well, I'm personally enabled with Coil. So I get my payments. I see my uh, Interledger protocol payments coming through. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed the rewards of those viewing my content and going to my website. So I love it. Um, so tell me a bit about the adoption you're seeing as far as folks like myself, content creators, um, publishers, and so forth, and what industries you're targeting as well, in particular, you know, um, as far as your strategy? Yeah, uh, that was a great question. So when we first started, we sort of had this dream about um, the ideal world that we were sort of envisioning was one where all the websites were web monetization enabled, all the users were web monetization enabled, um, all the users paid like a small fixed amount per month. Um, and then that money gets streamed in real time to the websites as you're browsing the web. That was sort of the, the vision. Um, and what that would enable is, well, if websites are making plenty of money on this uh, revenue stream, then maybe they don't need to have ads. Maybe they don't need to charge you a separate subscription and so on. Um, and so that was kind of the, the general idea. Now, as we went on into the market, um, what we found was people really loved the openness. So the fact that you can have a neutral protocol that's still incredibly efficient, fees are very low, um, that you can use to like pay creators. Um, but I think a lot of people got stuck with the sort of streaming payments model, right? Because it, when there aren't that many users, um, you don't get very much. And then if there aren't that many websites, then um, the user doesn't get many benefits from the websites. And then for the websites, it's not really worth creating a lot of special benefits because there are not that many users. And so um, it doesn't have very good story early on. Um, and so now what we're starting to think about more is how do we enable other types of use cases over Interledger? So like if you wanted to subscribe to a specific creator like on Patreon, um, or you wanted to um, you know, buy a ticket for a specific article or a specific movie online or something like that, how would you do that over Interledger? Um, and I think what that's gonna enable is it's gonna make this more viable for these early adopters. Um, but I think the thing where we've seen like a really, really strong signal was people want an open payment method and they are very sensitive to BS where it's like, oh, you know, use Bitcoin or use our thing. Like that's not going to, that's not going to work because it's going to be one specific system. You know, we were talking about how systems fall behind technically because the technology constantly moves on. If you can't evolve the system, it doesn't keep up. Um, and so you really need some kind of um, simple abstraction layer like Interledger. And so, 
we've we've just sensed a lot of demand for that, and so that's what we're going to focus on, less so and more so than the streaming. Got it, got it. That totally makes sense. Um, any hints as to what we can expect maybe this year? That you know, I know there's probably things under NDA and re ready for PR releases, but any hints you can give to us? Yeah, I'll give I'll give you a hint. So. Um, we, we've been thinking about a lot about the integration with different wallet providers. So mm -hmm. today, when a wallet provider integrates into Ledger, they pretty much implement it from scratch. So they, they start with, okay, what's the Interledger protocol? You know, they might run a open source connector, which is sort of, um, it's like the, the Interledger equivalent of a router, like the thing that actually processes the packets. But there's a lot of other stuff in Interledger that you also need to implement, like the actual higher level payment protocols, for example. And so today, wallet providers kind of start from scratch. And we've started to notice that that's becoming a problem. Uh, number one, wallet providers have different levels of expertise with Interledger. Um, and so they sometimes don't implement it in the most efficient way possible um, by several orders of magnitude. Um, and so, uh, so that's a problem. And then also they don't implement all of the functionality, right? So you end up with providers that only uh, support receiving or you know things like that. And so um, our goal for this year is to basically create some kind of um, you know open source project that gives you the full Interledger you know package in one in one piece. Um, and we'll have more details like as as we officially announce that, but. Um, that's kind of my focus uh, for this year is how do we unlock the full functionality of Interledger as opposed to just this very narrow streaming payments use case. Got it. Well, I'm excited to uh, see those updates. That's exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so I want to talk about Ripple and XRP and um, the situation that we see happening with the SEC with the lawsuit. You know, you were at Ripple, of course, um, I'm sure still closely connected as you're working on Coil. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this whole situation and the SEC's move? Yeah, I mean, so it was a huge surprise to me, at least, um, to, to see the lawsuit come out, um, especially like, you know, over Christmas and like it felt very, you know, they were leaving office. And so at the last moment they sort of filed this. Um, I think that it's done a lot of damage um, in the sense that, you know, a lot of exchanges have delisted XRP. Um, I think it's caused a lot of uncertainty um, for companies like ourselves that use XRP for, for settlement. It's sort of like, what does this mean? Um, it seems like the SEC themselves don't know exactly if, if XRP is a security or not. At least that's what they said in a recent court filing. Um, and so the main thing that I want is clarity and I want it as soon as possible. Um, and I think for me, it's sort of like, you know, frustrating because I am a technologist. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a you know, I'm not really on that side of the coin. And so for me, it's just like, I think XRP has, has the, the best technology out of the major cryptos. And of course I'm biased, but like, I, you know, I genuinely believe that. I think that, you know, we shouldn't have cryptos that are proof of work based just because of the carbon footprint. Um, I think proof of stake is problematic because you're basically, um, it, it's, it's plutocracy. It's like, you know, the rich control the system, which, you know, it's great if you're rich, but it's not so great if you're not, basically. Um, and I really like the XRP Ledger's governance model of like you pick validators and then you're just going to be on whatever fork the, those validators are on. And so as long as you agree with the validators, you can continue to be on that network. Um, it's really the way I sometimes explain it, it's, it's going to the root of what consensus is. Consensus is not something you can ever coerce. I can't force you to agree with me, right? right? And so we already have that situation where like, if I disagree with the rest of the Bitcoin network and I use a different set of rules, I will be on a fork. Doesn't matter how much mining power you have, doesn't matter how much mining power I have, we'll fork. And so XRP Ledger basically just takes that model and says, okay, well, people decide who they want to not fork with. And then we just have an algorithm that does all the, the details of keeping the ledger going and like validating which transactions are verified and so on. And so the, the whole proof of stake and proof of work is sort of this weird intermediary step between choosing an algorithm and then choosing validators that you don't really need, right? Like you can just choose the validators directly, right? Um, and so, I don't know, that, I feel very strongly that eventually blockchain has to mature to the point where like, we see more ledgers like XRP that are using that governance structure. 
Um, and it's unfortunate that, you know, the government who aren't necessarily the most tech savvy people are kind of interfering in, in kind of the market process of trying to figure out what's the best technology, what ledger is actually going to be the one people choose. Um, and I, I mean, there have been articles kind of making allegations that they weren't just purely disinterested regulators and I'll let people do their own research. But um, if that's the case or if that's part of it, that's even worse for me. I think so, you know, I'm just hoping that we can resolve this loss so we can create clarity in the market and we can go back to trying to figure out what's the best ledger, what's the best technology um, for the planet, for the users. I mean, it sounds very cliche, but you know, um, what's the best technology for the world? So um, that's that's my take on the lawsuit. For sure. And certainly the clarity is needed, not just for XRP, but for many of the other cryptos in the market. Th that's the other thing too. It's like, you know, people are, you know, if, you know, if, if the SEC wanted to hurt crypto in general, going after XRP would be a really good way because XRP is sort of one of the biggest, but also one of the least popular in the in the crypto community, if you will. Sure. Um, and so rather than closing ranks and saying like, hey, we're going to take a stand for our right to have crypto and to have our own tokens and, you know, people issuing tokens or whatever they want to do. Um, People are sort of like, yeah, ha, ha, Ripple, like we'll throw them under the bus, right? Um, and I think that is not a good strategy for the crypto community because once those precedents are set, they apply to everyone. They apply to Ethereum, they apply to everyone, right? Um, and so, I don't know, I hope that, um, I hope that everything works out. I hope the SEC makes the right decision. Um, like I said, I mean, my my passion is mostly about IntelliJ these days. So, um, you know, I, I I still have XRP, like I mentioned. I still care a lot about what happens to Ripple, the company. I'm still a shareholder of Ripple. I know a lot of the people there, um, but I will also continue the work and I'll continue the fight, you know, with or without XRP. I think, you know, for me, it's like, you know, payments just broken. It needs to be fixed, um, and and I hope that we can do it with XRP because there's so much work that's already gone into it. Um, but, you know, whatever happens, happens. We'll have to adjust. Sure. Um, and what, I don't know if you're too familiar with, with uh, Gary Gensler, and uh, he seems to be knowledgeable, well-informed about crypto. He's uh, teached it at, uh, or taught it, I should say, at, at MIT. Um, any thoughts that and maybe he might come in and make things a bit easier for the crypto market as a whole, including you know Ripple and, and, and XRP? Yeah, I mean, I don't know him personally. Um, I've seen videos of him, and he seems definitely knowledgeable. Um, definitely more knowledgeable than past SEC commissioners when it comes to crypto. So I, that gives me some hope. Um, but at the same time, I also, you know, anything can happen. And like, you know, if you're not, if you're not in, in those discussions, if you don't run in those circles, like it does feel sometimes a little random with like what decision gets handed down. I think that where I'm a little bit, where I'm probably more optimistic right now is that the court will make, they seem to be, you know, also fairly knowledgeable about different cryptos and, and sort of how they how they work and so on. Um, and they don't, they have called some of the inaccuracies in in some of the pleadings that have that have come out from the SEC. Um, so uh, I'm, I, have, I have some hope there, but at the same time, you know, it, you know probably shouldn't be commenting because it's, it's still actively <laughs> litigated. So I'll, I'll stop there. Sure. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on the evolution of Ripple as a company and the vision for XRP being a bridge asset, obviously different use cases and different companies that Ripple X has funded to build um, utility. You know, I, I, what do you, was your take and, and do you still see that vision and, and the, the need for XRP being the bridge currencies and, and CBDCs coming along and, and the private ledgers and all these things. And I interviewed David Schwartz uh -huh. <laughs> not too long ago. So we talked about it, but I want to get your perspective on, on it as well. Sure. Um, so I would say like I have a fairly different vision for XRP than Ripple does, um, and, which is basically, you know, I really want it to be purely a settlement asset for payments. I don't want it to be smart contracts. I don't want it to be, you know, store of value. I just want it to be good for payments. If I want to get money from A to B, it, that's what it, what it should be. And so, you know, when I was at Ripple, you know, we actually worked on smart contracts all the way back in 2013. And I decided 
um, to cancel the project, which, you know, a lot of people might point at that and say like, wow, that was a terrible decision if you look at what happened with Ethereum mm -hmm. uh, and how successful Ethereum became. But I also still stand by that decision because when you add all this complexity to your ledger, right, you make it to an incomplete programming language, put it on your ledger, um, you've got all these different features. A blockchain is already a very complex system, right? And so every time you add complexity, there is a big trade-off, which is like there's security risks involved with that. There's potential bugs that could be in there. Um, there you're attracting different kinds of use cases that may not live well next to each other. Um, so for example, some use cases, they might be very latency sensitive. So you really want to optimize for a fast ledger. Um, but then if you want to also optimize for having smart contracts, well, some transactions might be really long running. And so that might slow down your overall transaction processing. So the, at the end of the day, like you're, you're not going to have this like one perfect ledger that does everything for everybody. Right. right. Um, and so I really wanted, um, or still want XRP ledger to be as pure bread of a, uh, payments ledger as possible. Um, another thing that I feel like I learned from the uh, early days of Ripple is like we had a decentralized exchange long before Ethereum even existed, right? So we got to experience a lot of the pros and cons of, of a decentralized exchange. And so um, I'm still interested in some of these protocols that sort of deconstruct uh, exchanges and say like, well, there's different parts of an exchange. We can maybe have like a centralized matching engine, but then the actual settlement of transactions and custody is maybe separate from that. And I, I think some of that is really interesting to explore, um, but like a fully um, on ledger exchange where the matching engine is the blockchain, I don't think is a very good idea just because it's not a very good fit for that type of like what you're trying to optimize for. You really, for a matching engine, you want really fast execution, you want really low fees, um, and a blockchain is not very conducive to, to either of those. And so um, I wish that XRP was gonna be more pared down, more minimalist, um, but I think a lot of the rest of the XRP community is currently going in a different direction. Um, and so we'll see how it all plays out, but you know, that's the sort of internal politics that you know, every, every crypto has. Sure. And there's quite a few things that are being built in, in um, I guess, in conjunction with, with, with that if Flare. And then I just spoke to Jack Lua Wanchain and offering some DeFi options for XRP holders. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on Flare and what they're doing and uh, their, their vision? Um, well, I mean, I'm obviously appreciative that um, they, you know, chose XRP to, you know, to power some of the technology. And, um, you know, I, I've just been for the last uh, three plus years since starting Coil. You know, I no longer work for a blockchain company. I work for Coil now, um, and so I don't keep up with it nearly as much as I used to. And so I, I frankly just don't know that much about blockchain technologies that have been happening more recently, unless they've been sort of payments related. Um, and so I can't really say much about Flare. It seems like they know what they're doing, and but I haven't really looked at it too much. Got it. Um, so my final question here on Ripple before we go into the rest of the market, um, any interesting, embarrassing stories you can share with Brad or, or Chris that... <laughs> interesting and embarrassing stories with Brad and Chris. <laughs> um, I don't know. <sighs> interesting, embarrassing stories. Like I would say like... Um, you know, the early days of Ripple were really the most fun. I, I remember actually Chris would often come in and say like, hey, enjoy this time because you're going to look back and it's going to be the, 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 your favorite time. And he was completely right. Um, you know, you would you would go into the office and we would just like, you know, be hanging out. Like I remember there was one time we wanted to give away some XRP. Um, mm -hmm. And so we made a bunch of vouchers. And then one of our engineers um, was sort of very security conscious and so you wanted to make sure that nobody would like secretly access the vouchers and like steal the xrp even like <laughs> among the employees and so he ended up making this beautiful envelope with a lot of glitter on it and like weird you know the tape around it and stuff like that to make sure that it was you know tamper evident um i don't know there's like a lot of fun stuff like that but um i don't know if there's like one story with chris of red that like stands <laughs> out to me I, I had to ask. Um, <laughs> let's let's talk about the uh, Bitcoin and the crypto market. We're, we're certainly in a bull market now. We're seeing a lot of adoption on different fronts. You know, particularly with Bitcoin getting adoption, people are using it not as a payment solution, but more of a store of value, digital gold. 
uh, Tesla putting on his balance sheet or accepting as a payment as well. What are your thoughts on all of that, given that, you know, you were on Bitcoin.org back in 2012 and look how far we've come? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't expect it to get anywhere near the attention that it has gotten. And I think the part that I really underestimated was you know, once people start to make money just investing in Bitcoin, I think that attracted just a tremendous amount of interest. And it kind of makes sense because like we're in a world where interest rates are extremely low. And so people are desperate to find a place to like put their money where it generates any kind of yield. Um, and interestingly, like crypto, I mean, it's, it's crypto is not backed by anything. Um, it doesn't give you any dividends or interest or of any kind. Um, but the one thing it does have is it's it's a fixed supply. And so people are uh, parking their money there because they, they think it's okay, well, it's, at least it has some sort of built-in scarcity. Um, I think the jury's still out as to whether that will hold up in the long run. I mean, I hold crypto um, uh, and I'm taking that risk, but um, we don't know. Like it could, it could just be this thing that happened for a couple of decades and then everyone forgot about it after, again. You know, I think there's nothing inherent in crypto that says like it's the future, right? Um, I think it's an interesting ad asset class to be added to the to the mix and to be an option. Um, I think that a lot of the practical use cases that have been proposed for blockchain don't add up for me. Uh, I think a lot of people are trying to do things over blockchain where I don't see any reason why it needs to be on a blockchain. Um, I've seen some use cases that I think are interesting, like for example, everyone's favorite uh, a use case right now, NFTs. Um, I think it does make sense where like, you know, uh, when I first heard NFTs proposed to me, it was, um, it was around concert tickets. Um, yeah. and so people were saying like, hey, you could buy your concert ticket and you could resell it. And I was like, why doesn't the concert venue just make an API? If they want to enable secondary sales and stuff like that, they could just make an API. The store who owns the, the ticket, they could just do that. You don't need a blockchain for that. But when you're talking about NFTs for things like art, where you're trying to collect the artwork, well, I don't want to be dependent of that artist's web server staying up, like, cause that's probably gonna go away someday. And so if I'm a collector, using a blockchain is not the worst idea. So there are some use cases that are um, that are emerging, but I also think that there are a lot of ones that are sort of like, why, I don't see why a blockchain is involved in this at all. Do, do you, so you're, are you not a big believer in decentralized finance and what what's the movement towards less centralization of banking and all those things? So, you know, I have to be very careful to stay in my lane, right? Like there's, I don't have expertise on a lot of things. I do have a lot of expertise, I think on payments because I spent literally the last decade thinking about nothing else. Um, and so within that work, I would say, you know, we, we did a couple of projects at Ripple where we looked at some DeFi type use cases like, like trade finance and things like that. Um, and again, often I would come back with this sort of impression that like, you know, if the, trade authority of XYZ country wants to have a trade finance system that's sort of a central trade finance system, it doesn't have to be a blockchain, it could just be run by that government, right? And, you know, I'm, governments are not, you know, particularly amazing at running IT infrastructure, um, but they're still not as bad as trying to run it as a blockchain in, in most cases, I think. So, um, I don't know. I. I like the use cases that I looked at often didn't pan out, but I haven't looked at every use case. And so I can't say there are, aren't ones that are great. Like NFTs, I think are, are fine use case for the technology, so. For sure. Um, so final question before we go into the rapid fire, you know, your, your focus is certainly on payments. You're doing a lot on that front, um, interledger protocol, coil, um, web monetization and so forth. Where do you see uh, payments in three to five years, and I know you're you're trying to make a dent on that and change things. But where, where do you see things? Um, is, is it the vision that Ripple has that money is moving at the same pace as data? Um, yeah, I, I mean, like there's this uh, saying. I, I think it's attributed to Bill Gates, which is sort of um, people always overestimate the change that can happen in two years, and they always underestimate the change that can happen in ten. Hmm. Um, and I think the same thing sort of happened for me with, with Bitcoin, which like I've been in Bitcoin now for more than 10 years. And, um, I would say that I definitely underestimated where we would be now, but I probably overestimated where we would have been like, you know, 2014 or something like that. And so I think with payments, it's similar where, um, I think that in three to five years, I don't, 
think we'll see like a huge change, um, but I think we'll start to see um, Interledger, maybe a, a similar technology um, carve out a niche somewhere um, and, and start to get a sort of a foothold, kind of like if you think back to like the dial up days of the internet, um, where like you'd have a couple of enthusiasts and they would you know, probably still pay pretty high fees to get on the internet and probably still have a lot of friction trying, trying to use it. Um, but at least it's, it, it was there as a global network and you could start to play around with the, the, with the capabilities that it gives you. Um, and so I'm hoping that Interledger in three to five years will be at that stage where like there's a small little fledgling ecosystem of people are using it for these, um, maybe not mainstream, but you know, for these interesting use cases um, and that'll grow from there. And then maybe in 10 years, it'll be how, how most pay payments are sold. That's amazing. And uh, I would love to continue uh, talking to you as things progress and we'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, but as we wrap it up, what's your favorite food? My favorite food, I don't know if I have one favorite food. I, I'll give you one that I really like that I haven't had in uh, probably 20 years, which is um, flat le soupe. It's a type of like shredded crepe soup. Ah. Um, and it's, um, I think it's from Southwestern Germany, but don't quote me on that. But I, I used to get it from uh, a friend of mine, his grandmother would make it and it was just amazing. So I haven't had it in many years. Sounds delicious. Um, what's your favorite musician or band? Um, so, I mean, I'm this sort of very boring person that just spends all day working. So I just try to pick like some playlist and where I don't have to worry about it. I think the last time I really got excited about an album was quite a few years ago. It was um, Peter Fox's album. He's like a German rapper. Yeah, he was part of the group Seed with three E's. Um, and I really, really thought that was that album was amazing. So uh, probably that one. Awesome. Uh, favorite movie? Um, that would have to be Agora, which is, um, it's a movie about Hypatia of Alexandria. And the reason I like that movie so much is because it's sort of, it, it's about like the burning of the library of Alexandria and, and this um, science teacher who's sort of in that um, environment. And it's sort of, the light of the world, the light of science being extinguished um, with, um, with, with superstition, prejudice, and, and politics, and, and a lot of the negative aspects of humanity. And she's sort of fighting for, you know, science to survive and continue on. And for me, that's been a fight that's been very close to my heart for a lot, a lot of time growing up. I had this big, um, uh, thing while I was growing up where I sort of was trying to figure out, you know, am I religious? Am I atheist? What, where do I fit? And I, I decided that, you know, there's room for spirituality, but I do believe in, in science. And I do believe that we need to have some kind of idea about objective reality. Yep. And even today, like, I kind of feel that we are, um, that's slipping away a little bit because, because people are less um, willing to challenge their own beliefs, they're less willing to be humble, they're less willing to um, to change their minds. Um, it's all becoming very partisan. And so that sure. movie always gets me. So I definitely recommend people watch it. Uh, it's a good movie. I'll definitely have to check that one out myself. Uh, what's your favorite book? Oof, um, favorite book. Um, Oh my God, I'm not gonna remember the title now. So that's gonna be really awkward. But um, there is the author of XKCD. He made this, I think it's just called What If or something like that. It's basically, he went through a bunch of different scenarios um, uh, where like, what if this happened? What if that happened? And what would that look like? Like, what if somebody threw a baseball at the speed of light? And then sort of, you know, he goes through the physics and the, the math of that. Um, and I think he more recently did one, which is more like a how-to um randall monroe i think is the author um and i really love that sort of stuff again so the my science um you know bent so it's just really fun because it's like science but also entertainment right it's like a lot of fun to think these crazy scenarios <laughs> awesome and when you're not working on coil uh or doing work on payments what are you doing for fun as a hobby so it's really funny because like um, I was thinking about, um, you know, you gave me the questions at a time. So I had some time to think about, you know, what's my hobby. And like, I, you know, I really like experiencing different things. So I don't really have a hobby that I really stick to for a very long time. 
Um, but I also thought of an answer, which is um, it used to be my job to be a programmer, but now I'm a CEO. So it's no longer my job to be a programmer. So I end up coding on evenings and weekends. So I guess my hobby now is programming. So I guess that's my hobby. Very cool. Stefan, uh, absolute pleasure chatting with you, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And like I said, I, I want to talk to you as things progress with Coil and, uh, and, and with the Interledger protocol. So you're welcome back at any time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And I hope I didn't aggravate people out there too much. I just <laughs> try to be honest. And <laughs> I try to give you my, my honest opinion. Yeah.